Good evening. Salamu alaikum. Let me begin by thanking the Muslim Student Association and the Evangelical Christian Union for the invitation to participate in tonight's dialogue. And I also want to thank especially Dr. Vodawi for his willingness to join in participating in this event this evening. It's been my prayer that God may guide us all in our spiritual journeys and that tonight's event might be a significant step forward for some of us in our journey toward Him. Now in our day of religious relativism and pluralism, a debate like the one this evening is incredibly politically incorrect. Uh, all religions are supposed to be equally true, right? So what's the fuss all about? Well, the answer to that question, it seems to me, is that religious relativism, which is almost unthinkingly accepted by a great many students today, uh, may not be true after all. It seems to me that religious relativism is in fact logically inconsistent and therefore cannot be true. The world's religions conceive of God or gods in so many contradictory ways that they cannot all be true. In particular, and I'm sure Dr. Butter we would agree with me here, the concept of God in Islam and Christianity is so different in crucial respects that both religions cannot be right. For example, Christians believe that God is tri-personal, that the second person of the Trinity took to himself a human nature, that Jesus of Nazareth was therefore both man and God, that in his human nature he died to pay the death penalty of sin that you and I deserved, but that God raised him from the dead thereby showing his sacrificial death to be effective. Muslims deny all these things. We cannot both be right. We could both be wrong. Uh, maybe it's the Buddhists who are right. But uh, we can't both be correct. Thus, every one of us, whether Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, agnostic, or what have you, needs to ask himself what reasons we have for thinking our persuasion to be true. Otherwise, we run the risk of being self-deluded. Accordingly, I'm going to defend two basic contentions in tonight's dialogue. Number one, there are good reasons to think that the Christian conception of God is true. And second, there are not comparably good reasons to think that the Islamic conception of God is true. So let's turn to my first basic contention, that there are good reasons to think that the Christian conception of God is true. Now obviously Christianity, like Islam, comes in a variety of forms. But what I'll be discussing this evening is what the writer C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity. The common beliefs of all of the broad segments of Christendom, whether Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant. In particular, I'm going to suggest First, that Jesus of Nazareth regarded himself as the unique, divine Son of God. And secondly, that his divine self-understanding was vindicated by his resurrection from the dead. Let's talk first about whether Jesus of Nazareth regarded himself as God's unique, divine Son, or only as a prophet, as Muslims claim. I want to examine several sayings of Jesus which are demonstrably authentic, that is to say, actually uttered by the historical Jesus and which disclose his divine self-understanding. In fact, today the majority of New Testament scholars believe that among the historically authentic words of Jesus are claims that reveal his divine self-understanding. Jesus' radical self-concept is disclosed, for example, in his parable of the wicked tenants of the vineyard in Luke chapter 20. Even skeptical scholars like those in the radical Jesus seminar admit the authenticity of this parable. In this parable, the owner of the vineyard sends servants to the tenants of the vineyard to collect its fruit. The vineyard symbolizes Israel. The tenants are the Jewish religious leaders. 
The servants are the prophets sent by God, and the owner is God himself. The tenants beat and reject the owner's servants. Finally, the owner says, I will send my only beloved son. They will listen to my son. But instead, the tenants kill the son because he is the heir to the vineyard. Now, what does this parable tell us about Jesus' self-understanding? It tells us that he thought of himself as God's special son, distinct from all the prophets, God's final messenger, and even the heir to Israel. This was no mere Jewish prophet. Jesus' self-concept as God's unique son comes to explicit expression in Matthew 11:27, Jesus said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Again, there's good reason to regard this as an authentic saying of the historical Jesus. It's drawn from an old source which is shared by Matthew and Luke which scholars call the Q document. Moreover, it's unlikely that the early church invented this saying because it says that the Son is unknowable. No one knows the Son except the Father. But for the post-Easter church, we can know the Son. So this saying is not the product of later church theology. But what does this saying tell us about Jesus' self-concept? It tells us that he thought of himself as the exclusive and absolute Son of God and the only revelation of God the Father to mankind. Now think of it. If Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be, then he was crazier than Jim Jones and David Koresh put together. Finally, I want to consider one more saying. Jesus saying on the date of his second coming in Mark 13:32. Jesus said, but of that day or that hour, no man knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. This is an authentic saying of the historical Jesus because the later church, which regarded Jesus as divine, would never have invented a saying ascribing ignorance or limited knowledge to Jesus. But here, Jesus says he doesn't know the date of his return. But what do we learn from this saying? It not only reveals Jesus' self-consciousness of being the one Son of God, but it also presents us with an ascending scale from men to the angels to the Son to the Father, a scale on which Jesus transcends every human being and even every angelic being. This is really incredible stuff. And yet this is what the historical Jesus believed. And this is only one facet of Jesus' self-understanding. C.S. Lewis was right when he said, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. Now, as visible demonstrations of his radical claims, Jesus carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. He was finally crucified for these claims on the charge of blasphemy. But God confirmed his claims by raising him from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then he must have been who he claimed to be, the unique divine Son of God. Now, most people would think that the resurrection of Jesus is something to which historical investigation is irrelevant. You just either believe this by faith or not. But I spent two years at the University of Munich in Germany as a fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation studying the historical basis for the resurrection of Jesus. And I found that the historical grounds for that event are remarkably good. I can only summarize my findings here. 
by saying that there are three major historical facts that are established by the consensus of biblical criticism that support the resurrection of Jesus. The empty tomb, Jesus' appearance as alive after his death, and the very origin of the Christian faith itself. Let me say a brief word about each of these. First, the evidence indicates that Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers on the Sunday morning following his crucifixion. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian scholar who has specialized in the study of the resurrection, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. And he lists 28 prominent scholars in support. I can think of at least 16 more that he neglected to mention. According to D.H. Van Dalen, it is extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. But those assumptions may simply have to be changed in light of the facts. Second, the evidence indicates that on separate occasions, different individuals and groups of people saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. In his first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul listed some of these appearances. He wrote, Christ was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. According to the late Norman Perrin of the University of Chicago, the more we investigate the traditions with regard to the appearances, the firmer the rock begins to appear upon which they are based. These appearances were bodily and physical, and were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Third, the very origin of the Christian faith implies the reality of the resurrection. All historians agree that Christianity sprang into being because the original disciples sincerely believed that God had raised Jesus from the dead, and they proclaimed this message everywhere they went. But where in the world did they come up with that outlandish belief? Well, if you deny that Jesus really did rise from the dead, then you've got to explain the origin of the disciples' belief in terms of either Christian influences or Jewish influences. Now, obviously, it couldn't have been the result of Christian influences for the simple reason that there wasn't any Christianity yet. But neither can it be explained by Jewish influences because the Jewish concept of resurrection was radically different from Jesus' resurrection. As the renowned New Testament scholar Joachim Yeremias puts it, nowhere does one find in the literature of ancient Judaism anything comparable to the resurrection of Jesus. Apart from the resurrection of Jesus, the origin of the disciples' belief remains inexplicable. Attempts to explain away these three great facts like the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible, naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. Thus, it seems to me that there are good reasons to believe that the Christian conception of God is true. Now, the Muslim conception of God shares many elements of similarity with the Christian conception of God. This is only to be expected, since historically, Islam is an offshoot of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It therefore has many elements of truth. Nevertheless, I do not see any comparably good reasons to think that the Islamic conception of God is wholly true. Now, I sincerely hope that in saying this, I do not offend anybody. I am not trying to put anybody down or uh, attack anyone personally. But I'm simply asking the question, what good reason is there 
to think that the Islamic conception of God is true. As the Quran says, produce your proof if you speak truly. Let me share two reasons why I am persuaded that the Islamic conception of God is not adequate. My misgivings are both philosophical and historical. My philosophical difficulty is that Islam seems to have a morally inadequate concept of God. Muslims and Christians agree that God is the greatest conceivable being by definition. If there were anything that you could conceive of greater than God, then that would be God. Thus, necessarily, God is the greatest conceivable being. Now, besides being all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, and so forth, the greatest conceivable being must also be all-loving. For it's obviously better to be loving than unloving, and God is a morally perfect being. Therefore, God, as the morally perfect being, must be all-loving. And this is exactly what the Bible affirms. The Bible says, God is love. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. Or again it says, God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a contrast when we read what the Quran says about God's attitude towards sinners. According to the Quran, God does not love sinners. Listen to the following passages. God loves not the unbelievers. God loves not evildoers. God loves not the proud. God loves not transgressors. God loves not the prodigal. God loves not the treacherous. God is an enemy to unbelievers. Over and over again, the Quran declares that God does not love the very people that the Bible said God loves so much that he sent his only son to die for them. Now, this may seem paradoxical in light of the Quran's calling God, Al-Rahman Al-Rahim, the All-Merciful, until you realize that according to the Quran, what God's mercy really cashes out to is that if you believe and do righteous deeds, then God can be counted on to give you what you have earned plus a bonus. Thus, the Quran says, work and God will surely see your work. Every soul shall be paid in full for what it has earned. Those who believe and do deeds of righteousness and perform the prayer and pay the alms, their wage awaits them with the Lord. According to the Quran, God's love is thus reserved only for those who earn it. It says, to those who believe and do righteousness, God will assign love. So the Quran assures us of God's love for the God-fearing and the good doers, but he has no love for sinners and unbelievers. Thus in the Islamic conception, God is not all-loving. His love is partial and has to be merited. But don't you think that this is an inadequate conception of God? A God who says, if you measure up to these standards, then I will love you. As the greatest conceivable being, the most perfect being, the source of all goodness and love, God's love must be unconditional and impartial. Therefore, the Islamic conception of God seems to be morally inadequate. Philosophically, therefore, I cannot agree to it. My second misgiving about Islam is that it has a historically inadequate conception of Jesus. According to the Quran, Jesus was not divine, but merely a human prophet. The Quran says, they are unbelievers who say, God is the Messiah, Mary's son. The Messiah, son of Mary, was only a messenger. The Quran goes on to imagine the following dialogue between God and Jesus. God said, Jesus, did you say to men, take me and my mother as gods? Jesus answers, no, I only said serve God, my Lord and your Lord. This passage evidently embodies the misunderstanding that the Christian Trinity 
is supposedly comprised of God the Father, Mary, and their offspring, Jesus, a view which no Christian would affirm. The Quran also states that Jesus was not, in fact, crucified. It says, Jews say, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God. Yet they did not slay him, neither crucified him, but only a likeness of that was shown to them. Later, Muslim tradition says that Judas was mistakenly crucified in Jesus' place. Now, obviously, either the New Testament or the Quran hasn't got its facts straight here. They can't both be right. Both claim to be divinely inspired. So you can't settle the issue by appealing to that. So we must simply ask ourselves the question, which is more apt to be historically reliable? A collection of documents which was written down within the first generation while the eyewitnesses were still alive, or a book written 600 years later by a man who had not even any first-hand contact with the New Testament. Why, to ask the question is to answer it. The primary source document is clearly the documents of the New Testament. And in fact, legendary stories about Jesus have found their way into the pages of the Quran. I'm referring to stories about Jesus which are found in the so-called apocryphal gospels. Uh, these are forgeries which appeared in the second and third centuries after Christ and which the Quran unwittingly repeats as facts. For example, the Quran mentions the story borrowed from the apocryphal infancy gospel of Thomas of how the boy, Jesus, made a bird out of clay and then made it come to life. The story of Jesus' birth is also fancifully embellished in the Quran. Jesus comes out of Mary's womb talking and expounding Islamic theology. Here's how the Quran describes Jesus' birth. When Mary felt the throes of childbirth, she lay down by the trunk of a palm tree, crying, Oh, would that I had died! But a voice from below cried out to her, Do not despair. Your Lord has provided a brook that runs at your feet. And if you shake the trunk of this palm tree, it will drop fresh ripe dates in your lap. Therefore rejoice, eat and drink. Carrying the child, she came to her people, who said to her, Mary, you have surely committed a monstrous thing. Your father uh, was not a wicked man, nor was your mother unchaste. She made a sign to them, pointing to the child. But they replied, How can we speak to a babe in the cradle? Whereupon he spoke and said, I am the servant of Allah. He has given me the gospel and ordained me a prophet. His blessing is upon me wherever I go, and he has commanded me to be steadfast in prayer and to give alms to the poor as long as I live. He has exhorted me to honor my mother and to pur has purged me of vanity and wickedness. I was blessed on the day I was born. Blessed shall I be on the day of my death, and may peace be upon me on the day when I shall be raised to life. I think it's painfully obvious that this story has been rewritten in light of Islamic theology. Equally unreliable from a historical point of view is the Quran Zealot allegation that Jesus was not in fact crucified. A fact which even Robert Funk, the chairman of the Radical Jesus Seminar, recognizes as, and I quote, one indisputable fact about Jesus. It seems very clear then that the Quran presents us with a historically inadequate and therefore inaccurate picture of Jesus. For these and other reasons, even if I were not a Christian, I still could not become a Muslim. There's just no good reason to think that the Islamic conception of God is true. So in summary, we've seen two good reasons to think that the Christian conception of God is true. First, Jesus of Nazareth regarded himself as God's unique divine son. And second, his divine self-understanding was vindicated by his resurrection from the dead. Moreover, we've seen two good reasons to think that the Islamic conception of God is not wholly true. First, Islam seems to have a morally inadequate conception of God. And secondly, Islam has a historically inadequate conception of Jesus. It seems to me, therefore, that when we weigh the evidence as dispassionately and objectively as we can, the evidence suggests that God has revealed himself decisively to mankind in the person of Jesus of Nazareth 
Through him, we can come to know God's wonderful love and forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah, the sole creator, cherisher, and sustainer of the universe. And may his peace and blessing be upon his last messenger, Muhammad, and upon all prophets and messengers before him. I greet you all with the greeting of all of the prophets in its most complete form. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means may the peace, mercy, and blessing of Allah, God, capital G, be with you all. And I wish to thank you all organizers and participants, and especially Dr. Craig, for your participation this evening. We are meeting here this evening as uh, members of the one and same human family, I suppose. Most of us, however, belong to the Abrahamic ethical monotheistic faith which embraces Jews, Christians, and Muslims. It is thus very useful for us to exchange and share our views on tonight's topics and other ones. I'd like to indicate in the very beginning that no time will be spent in trying to prove the existence of Allah. I hope that Dr. Craig had fun last night trying to prove that. <laughs> it reminds me with a story of a teacher who walked in the classroom and he said, did any of you guys see God? They said, no. Any of you touched God or heard him? They said, no. He said, therefore, he does not exist. And a smart student stand and say, did any of you guys see the brains of our teacher? <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> one of the interesting, <laughs> thank you, thank you. One of the interesting questions that were posed to Ali, the cousin of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Somebody came to him and he said, "Prove to me that God exists." His answer was, "God ever absent, so that he exist, his existence need any proof." Uh, I believe Ali here was referring to what the Quran always points to as means of knowledge about God through the pure innate nature or fitrah, as God says that he breathed into every human being some of his spirit, reflection in ourselves and our creation in the environment and the cosmic order in which we all uh, live. These are all, as the Quran called them, ayat or signs of the existence of Allah. Not necessarily proof, just signs, very clear. So I must say that uh, both Muslims and their Christian brethren are on the same wavelength with respect to that issue. What we differ about, however, as Dr. Craig said, is what does the word monotheism mean? The question related to that would be the nature of Christ and uh, the issue of uh, Trinity. I'd like to begin first by spending a few minutes by defining what Muslims mean by monotheism because the same claim is also made uh, by Christians. <coughs> for the Muslim, there are at least three important conditions for pure monotheism. One is to believe that God is the sole creator, sustainer of the universe, no partner and no co-creator with him. Secondly. <coughs> Excuse me, that God alone is worthy of worship, which means none is to be worshipped instead of him, alongside with him, nor is God to worship through any of his creatures. No confession, no clergy with a specific uh, authority. Thirdly, that God is not only one numerically, but one also in attributes and person, which means there is only one person, there are no persons in uh, Godhead. For the Muslim, any departure from any of these three elements is regarded as so-called shirk, which is not only polytheism, actually it means in a broad sense to associate others with God in his exclusive divine attributes. The Quran presents that as the cardinal sin that will never be forgiven. It quotes Jesus, the blessed himself, as saying that he would be innocent of those who do the same. The Quran indicates that this pure monotheistic faith has been the mission and message of all, all prophets throughout history, and they invited all mankind, in fact, to willingly submit to God, follow his guidance in their life, which actually is the literal meaning of the term Islam, to achieve peace with God, within oneself, with others, human, animals, plants, ecology, through submission to God and acceptance of his faith. That's why the Quran says all prophets were Muslims, or their true followers were Muslims. There are no 
the legends, there's only one true religion of God. There are religions created by man either exclusively or mixing revelation with their own religious theology. The traits or attributes of God as they appear in the Quran uh, are quite clear when the Quran first of all says Laysa kamithlihi shay, there is absolutely nothing comparable unto God. Say he is God, the one and only, he begets not, nor was he begotten. The Quran is quite clear and there is none uh, comparable unto him. But in the meantime, we notice that in the Quran, besides the attributes that uh, Dr. Craig seemed to have emphasized in the Quran, uh, the attributes of glory, power, wisdom, uh, justice, creation, but I think alongside with that, which Dr. Craig did not mention, ample description in the Quran of the closeness of God to mankind, of his forgiving quality, of his holiness, of his mercy. In fact, the Quran called God Wadud, which is more than saying God is love, actually means fulling of compassionate love or loving compassion, Wadud. In fact, the readiness of God to forgive those who turn back to him is in itself an indication of this loving and caring quality. The origin of difference then, or the essence of it in my humble view, and as Dr. Craig also indicated, is the notion of God incarnate in the form of the second person, that is Jesus, peace be upon him. Considering him to be divine, full man and full God, infinite and uh, finite at the same time, which to the Muslim is a contradiction of term. In the view of the Muslim, it is not a nonsense. It is actually a deep belief that Jesus was one of the five greatest prophets in history. And we don't consider that nonsense. We consider it very relevant. We consider it very honorary because there is no greater blasphemy to be attributed to any prophet than claiming divinity contrary to the teaching of God that he revealed to all of the prophets. Now, the, uh, before I get to some of the arguments that sometimes are presented to prove or to try to show that Jesus indeed was God and that so-called the Muslim position is inadequate, let me directly first go through some of the points raised by uh, Dr. Craig. First of all, I agree with Dr. Craig that Trinity and pure monotheism are not compatible and one has to be right and the other is wrong and the Quran is very fair it actually says, and addressing those who rejected faith, it says, you or us are either guided or in manifest error. So that, that's the ultimate of fairness in the text of the Quran itself. But now let me get to some of the evidence that Dr. Craig presented us. When we talk, he talks about Luke and sending servants and then sending the only son. I must say first of all that the word servant of God is even more honorific even than son of God. In the Quran, for example, the term son or the term uh, uh, servant, abd of Allah, the servant of Allah has a very higher meaning even than speaking about son because we know from the biblical text that the word son of God is a term that was used to refer to any good person including any prophets and even non-prophets sometimes were called uh, son of God. But again, Dr. Craig seemed to have been looking very literally about the statements uh, in, uh, in the Bible about only and beloved. For example, we find evidence in the Quran that the term firstborn is attributed to more than one prophet, Abraham, Jacob, and David. If we take it literally, we'd say that's self-contradiction. First does not necessarily uh, one particular event. Uh, the term even only son is used metaphorically in the Bible, not in the literal sense. In Genesis 22, 2, for example, when it speaks about taking your only son, Isaac, obviously he was not the only son because Ishmael was already there. But what is more important when we speak about the, this notion of son, that 86 times in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as son of God, not once was he ever referred to as God the Son, that theology that developed later, and this is extremely significant. Dr. Craig raised also the issue about Matthew 11:27, when Jesus said that God gave me everything. Well, logically speaking, 
if someone is receiving and someone is giving, the one who is giving is greater and he's the only one God. Furthermore, if we take it literally that God me, gave me everything, then there is no trinity because God or the Father is totally emasculated and he has nothing because he gave everything already. So if you want to take it literally, it goes uh, both ways. Uh, Dr. Craig raised the question about the knowledge of the hour. But that itself actually is admission that he is not divine because one of the attributes of divinity is to know the hour, not to be unaware of what's going to happen in the future. As far as various statements made by the disciples to express their own religious experience, uh, man, angel, that Jesus is less than the angel or more than the angel, this is really immaterial because all of these, including the highest of angels, are creatures of God. And even if Jesus is greater or lower, still God is a category by himself. John Hex, in his introduction to the myth of God incarnate, indicates that this terminology should not be taken literally. And he said that, in his opinion, these are, were poetic statements used by the disciples or writers of the Gospels to express the significance of Jesus to them. Dr. Craig also mentioned about the miracles made uh, by Jesus or through Jesus. Aside from all these details about resurrection, because there are lots of questions about resurrections, by the way, and crucifixion, and it's not that unanimous. In fact, one time I had a full debate on that subject alone. But aside from that, I'd like to say two basic points. First of all, the fact that God raised Jesus, and there are places in the New Testament where it says God raised him, not that he raised himself itself shows that there is greater power who is ever living, who never dies, who raised him from the death. And resurrection is not a big deal and does not make a person really divine. God raises whoever he wishes. In fact, as you notice in a little brochure that would be available out, it's called Jesus in the Quran and the Bible. There is evidence in the Old Testament or Hebrew scripture in the first book of Kings, second book of Kings, in the Ezekiel, that God raised people from the death and sometimes even when the body of a dead person touched the bones of a prophet, he came back to life. And after all, God is going to raise us all in the day of judgment and resurrect us. Does that necessarily mean that we will be promoted to the position of Godhead? Okay. The uh, question of rejection of Islam, because I couldn't see in any of the points, quite frankly, that Dr. Uh, Craig presented to defend the concept of Christianity, I didn't find anything really that's convincing, and I'll come back to some more even on this if I have the time. But let me first make rebuttal for what he said about rejection of Islam. First of all, I would definitely reject uh, Dr. Craig's statement that Islam is an offshoot of Judaic Christian tradition. This is based on the false assumption that when two texts or two revelations are similar, then the latter must have copied from the earlier. But we know all, even from synoptic studies, in which he is very competent and aware, that it is also possible to have another explanation that both texts, in spite of the time difference, might have been based on a third common source. This is exactly what Muslims believe, that God, it is God who revealed the Torah to Moses, it is God who revealed the Injil or Gospel to Jesus, and it is the same God who revealed the Quran to Prophet Muhammad. So what is wrong with having similarity? It does not mean offshoot, and Muslims definitely reject this notion of offshoot. It's coming from the same source from which Judaism and Christianity based its beliefs. Dr. Craig, that says from the philosophical point of view, he says that Muslims do not have a morally adequate concept of God because of this notion of love. I have already indicated before the notion of love, which is already there in the Quran directly and indirectly and can be found in dozens and dozens and dozens of verses. But I think Dr. Craig perhaps had a poor exegesis of the Quran. I think he doesn't understand the mode of expression in the Quran, and that's why he came up with this erroneous conclusion that it is morally inadequate. When the Quran says that God does not love the Cruel, the unbelief, rejecter of faith, and all kind of evil uh, deeds. It's actually a metaphor of referring to rejection and not loving evil deeds. And when God speaks about loving the believers, loving those who are kind, it does not mean that it is an exclusive love for those people. 
It is also a metaphor of loving the good deeds. In fact, I would consider it morally inadequate for God to say, I love those who do evil and those who do good equally, and as such leaving us with the conclusion that it doesn't really make any difference, and that when uh, Adolf Hitler uh, encounters Mother Teresa uh, in some place in paradise, he smiles at her and says, Mother Teresa, after all, it didn't make any difference, did it? <laughs> but I think... But I think uh, the, the problem that I urge Dr. Craig to reconsider, really, is that he perhaps mixes between two things. Between a statements made in the Quran about loving and hating to refer to the good deeds and evil deeds in order to give us the moral inducement. That is morally adequate. That is the ultimate of moral adequacy, is to make a distinction between good and evil. But the other thing that he seemed to have mixed with it is the notion of God caring and loving human beings in spite of their evil. And in that we don't differ. For example, as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said it once, he said, if this world is worth even a wing of a fly, God would have not given the unbeliever even a drink of water from it. So people disobey God and defy them. He still let them breathe, let them eat, provide them with food, and all of that, give them a chance. And then after all of that, he says that still, if you repent and come back to me, your sins are blotted and I'll forgive you and receive you. There is a very beautiful description in the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that a person who comes to God repentant, God will be so happy, more happy than a man who lost in the desert and all of a sudden his camel left him with all his provision when he got his camel back. In one of the hadith Qudsi, God narrated to the Prophet that if you come to me one inch, I'll come to you one arm. If you come to me walking, I'll come to you running. Literally, God coming to you running. So I think there is a bit mix between God caring about all, including those who are disobedient. And if he doesn't care about them, why did he send prophets to guide them and to help them and open the door of his mercy for them? Having said that much and as much time would allow, I even go beyond what uh, Dr. Craig said because I did reject and made rebuttal for both his presentation against Islam and in defense of his own belief. First of all, when you refer even to statements attributed to Jesus, peace be upon him, claiming divinity, we always heard this John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes unto the Father but by me. I said, Amen. Every prophet speaks not for himself, and Jesus himself said that in John. He speaks for God who sent him. And since the way to God is one way, then a prophet in his lifetime is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can reach God except by following the way that God revealed to that prophet. That he said, I and the Father are one in John 10. But also in John 17, 11, he spoke about being one with his disciple. In John 14, 20, he said, I am in you as the Father is in me. Which means then the oneness with the Father is only oneness in purpose, not in divinity or essence let alone the Greek words, I don't have time to elaborate on that. There's more evidence to support that as well. Uh, some say that he said, whoever seen me, he has seen God. But we know that when it, uh, if I tell you, close your eyes and explain something, I say, do you see? And say, I see. Means I understand. That means who, anyone who knows me, since I reveal and explain what God revealed to me, he has seen God and known him, in fact. And both the Hebrew scripture and the New Testament say that nobody ever uh, saw God. It is reported also that he said to Thomas when he said, My God and my Lord, he did not say anything to him uh, and did not rebuke him. But again, we find some biblical scholars who go back and say that there are certain modes of expression in Greek and they provide an alternative translation that you, my godly Lord, this is a legitimate translation, they suggest my godly Lord, or mean that you are godlike, not literally that you are my God. It is said that according to Mark 14 that he accepted worship from others. This is indeed very strange because the word worship sometimes is used to refer to intense love. And I am sure that the mayor of Champagne is addressed in the meeting, your worship as well. If indeed Jesus claimed to be worshipped and it was understood that he's an object of worship, the pages of the New Testament would be full. But what we find that he himself worshipped God, he fell on his face and pray to God and prayer is petition from the infinite 
from the finite to the infinite. Some people raise the question about uh, telling the Jews when in John 8, uh, before Abraham was, I am. First, the word, the word I am itself does not really carry the connotation usually given to it, that uh, uh, this is the same term used in Exodus because the Greek term used in both cases is not the same. Number one. Number two, the existence before Abraham can be understood in view of the Bible itself. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, it speaks of Jesus as one who was destined before the foundation of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, the same thing speaks and uses the exact term for knowledge of God. So yes, Jesus, you and me, and everybody else pre-existed in the foreknowledge of God, to use the biblical term, before even the foundation of the earth. Some say, but why did the Jews take stones and try to, uh, to pelt him with it? Well, it is not that he said, I am God. And obviously, if a human being walking on earth say, I am God, people would say he's crazy and they would leave him alone. But I think the possible reason, as some theologians suggest, is that he healed the man on the Sabbath. And since the Sabbath was ordained by God, he made himself equal to God by healing the person on the Sabbath. That's why he had an eloquent response to them that the Sabbath is made for man, not man made uh, for the Sabbath. And the other thing that seemed to have offended the Jews as well is that they adored Abraham and by putting himself ahead of Abraham, in fact, they were uh, offended. And that can be found in John 8:53, which shows clearly that they didn't like the notion of putting himself above. In a few minutes that are remaining, I'll just even go beyond what Jesus uh, claimed because there is no claim really that is conclusive. Nowhere does he say, I am God or the Lord. And this matter should be crystal clear in matter of divinity, just like when God spoke to Moses. I am God, there is no Lord but me. You don't need uh, any ambiguous statements when it, when it comes to uh, teaching people the basics of their faith. But some people who refer to the... Uh, uh, statements made about Jesus, I must say in the first place that these are not binding on us. We don't believe that those disciples were prophets receiving revelation from God, contrary to the Christian belief. But even if you look at them, and of course their statement would be less authentic than his own statement, and none of his statements really made that uh, irrevocable and clear claim. Uh, the question of uh, Son of God we talked about, the question of, um, of um, baptism, for example, that appear in Matthew 28. We find that this is written in manuscripts beginning from the 4th century when the doctrine of Trinity became already official. One of the uh, historians of the church, some of the historians of the church noticed that Eusebius, the famous historian who died in 340, uh, referred to the same uh, quotation in Matthew 28, 19, 18 times without the using the so-called Trinitarian uh, baptismal formula which indicate, of course, it came later in his writing after the Nicene Council, which shows the great political factors that led to uh, Trinity being adopted. This is another issue about Constantine and his role in this. Even in the New Testament itself, we find numerous cases where the baptismal formula did not include the Trinitarian form, only in the name of Christ. You find that in Acts uh, 2.38, 8.16, 10.48, and 19. Uh, five. Uh, the question of Jesus being manifest in the flesh, the last point I understand and I have time for, uh, which is found in 1 Timothy 3.16. You find again in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible that it does not talk about Christ but about God. Actually it says, he who was manifest in the flesh, not that God was manifest in the flesh. And one of the things since uh, Dr. Uh, Craig keep claiming that the Bible is authentic, everything is authentic, there is no disagreement. I beg to disagree with you, Dr. Craig, because in the British Museum, in Codex A, it was found that one of the Greek manuscripts that originally written ho, H-O, which means which, that they found with analysis that there is a different ink that added the word S, the letter S to ho, and hos means God, and that totally changed the meaning, and this is only but one example of many of the various uh, editorial work that was done in the, uh, the scriptures. I don't know if I still have time, 30 seconds. In that last 30 seconds, I must say, with all due respect to you, Dr. Craig, and I appreciate your presentation and your faith and your 
uh, ardent view to present it that you could not present a convincing statement about why Trinity is better, nor could you make any effective rebuttal that Islam has inadequate uh, concept. In fact, Islam does have a morally sound uh, and instinctively acceptable and innately truth concept of the true monotheistic faith. Assalamu alaikum. Now, you'll remember in my first speech, I said that I was going to defend two contentions in tonight's debate. First, that there are good reasons to think that the Christian conception of God is true. And I had two sub-points here. First, that Jesus of Nazareth claimed to be the unique divine Son of God. And I looked at three sayings of Jesus, the parable of the vineyard, Matthew 11:27, and Mark 13, 32. I argued, first of all, that all of these are authentic sayings of the historical Jesus. And it's noteworthy that Dr. Badawi did not disagree with this, that these are authentic sayings of Jesus. So we can't dismiss them as being later corruptions. These are historically authentic to the historical Jesus. And therefore, the whole debate hinges on the interpretation of these passages. Do they, in fact, imply the Jesus' divine self-understanding? In the parable of the vineyard, I think that it does, because Jesus says that he is the unique son of God and that he is distinct from all the prophets, the final messenger sent by God to Israel. Now, Dr. Badawi replies, but servant in the Quran is an even more honorific title. But of course, that's irrelevant. The question is, how is the word used in Jesus' parable? And in the parable, it designates the prophets who are sent by God to Israel and the son is even higher than the prophets and distinct from them. So this clearly shows that Jesus thought of himself as not merely another Jewish prophet, but as God's unique son. Dr. Badawi also said, but the New Testament never uses the words God the son. Right, it, it speaks of the son of God. And the point is that Jesus thought of himself as a unique son of God that set him apart from all other humanity and all other prophets. And in fact, in John 1.18, it does have a rather remarkable phrase. John 1.18 says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. This statement was so outrageous, even for Christian copyists, that many manuscripts were later changed to read the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. But no, what John actually says is the only begotten God, Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. So clearly, this parable of the vineyard uh, shows us that Jesus thought of himself as God's unique son. In Matthew 11:27, Jesus claims to be the only revelation of God the Father to mankind. And all Dr. Badawi could say here was that, well, if God gave everything to the Son, then he doesn't have every, anything left for himself. I personally don't see the point. The, the point of the passage is, that Jesus claims to be the only and unique and absolute revelation of God the Father to mankind. That belongs to the historical self-understanding of the historical Jesus, like it or not. What about Mark 13, 32, uh, Jesus saying on the date of his second coming? Again, Dr. Badawi didn't deny that this shows Jesus thought of himself as higher than any human being, higher than any angelic being, and uh, approximate to the Father. But he says, well, as God, Surely Jesus must know the time of his return, not when Jesus is speaking in his human nature. I believe in a genuine incarnation, and as a human being, the full divine omniscience that Jesus possessed as God was not in his waking consciousness. Thus, you have in the New Testament a genuine baby Jesus, not the sort of baby Jesus that you have, as I read in the Quran story, where he comes out giving theological discourses. Uh, similarly, Dr. Badawi says, but Jesus himself worshipped God. Yes, in his human nature. Christians believe Jesus was genuinely a human being and as such submitted to and worshipped God uh, the Father. But notice that he doesn't deny the import of these passages that they teach Jesus' divinity and his unique sonship. He quotes John Hick as saying that these are just poetic passages. John Hick was my doctoral advisor at Birmingham. Dr. Hick is not a New Testament scholar. He is a, a theologian who lost his faith in the divinity of Christ uh, and has more or less become what is a modern-day Hindu. I would agree that the expression Son of God is metaphorical, just as the word Father is metaphorical, but it is a metaphor for indicating the closeness of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus being of same nature as the Father. 
But it doesn't mean that Jesus is the physical offspring of God, as the, the Quran uh, seemed to uh, reject. Dr. Badawi says, but Thomas's uh, confession, my Lord and my God, does not mean that he thought of Jesus as God. It simply means my godly Lord. That's just a woeful mistranslation of the Greek. The, the Greek is hakoriasmu kai hatheosmu, the God of me and the Lord of me. And that is clearly the Christological climax of the Gospel of John, Thomas's confession of the deity of Jesus, for which Jesus says, blessed are you, Thomas, because you have believed, uh, and blessed are those who believe without even seeing. So it seems to me that we have very good reason for thinking that Jesus did claim to be the unique and divine Son of God. Let me reinforce this by simply pointing out Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins. His parable showed that he had a consciousness of forgiving sins, and his table fellowship with sinners also showed that he uh, was acting out in a living parable his forgiveness of their sins. Royce Grunler, a New Testament scholar, says Jesus is constant, uh, consciously speaking as the voice of God on matters that belong only to God. The evidence clearly leads us to affirm that Jesus implicitly claims to do what only God can do to forgive sins. The religious authorities correctly understood his claim to divine authority to forgive sinners, but they interpreted his claims as blasphemous and sought his crucifixion. That's why Jesus was crucified, as we saw, on the charge of blasphemy. So I think we have good reasons for saying that a divine self-understanding belongs to the consciousness of the historical Jesus. Secondly, I argued that the resurrection of Jesus vindicates Jesus' radical claim. And I looked at three facts which are agreed upon by the consensus of New Testament scholars today. The empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus, and the very origin of the Christian faith. Notice that Dr. Butterwee did not deny any of these three facts. So that uh, these facts stand firmly established by the consensus of scholarship today. What he tried to do was to soften the impact of those facts by saying, well, but a resurrection doesn't make you divine. I agree entirely, it doesn't. But what it does do is it confirms Jesus' claims to divinity for which he was crucified. It is, as it were, God's divine confirmation of those radical claims for which he was crucified. As Wolfhard Pannenberg, the German theologian, has said, the, crucif or the resurrection of Jesus takes on such important significance because it's not just anybody or someone who was resurrected from the dead but because it is Jesus of Nazareth whose execution was instigated for his blasphemous claims. If the God of Israel has raised him from the dead, this means that the God of Israel has clearly vindicated those claims for which Jesus was crucified. Dr. Budwee says, but there are many resurrections in the Old Testament. Not at all. Those are revivifications, the return to the earthly life. Those people will die again. The resurrection to eternal life and glory is unique in the person of Jesus and thus without parallel. So it seems to me that we have both good evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, plus we see the theological significance of the resurrection of Jesus in its confirmation of Jesus' radical personal claims. Now what about my second contention that there are, good, or there are not comparably good reasons to think that the Islamic conception of God is wholly true? Notice that Dr. Badawi didn't give any arguments for the Islamic conception of God. He explained what they believe, and he said, I don't have to prove that God exists, and I agree with that, but he didn't give any positive arguments to show the Islamic conception of God is true. Now, I gave two reasons why I think the Islamic conception of God is not wholly true. First, it seems to me morally inadequate. Notice that he agrees with me that God is the perfect being, must be all-loving. So the issue here is, is the God of the Quran all-loving? And he says, yes, he is, because the word wadud is affirmed of God, that he's full of love uh, and, and compassion. But Dr. Badawi then gives away his case by saying in the next sentence, he is willing to forgive those who will turn back to him. Thus, you see, God's love is conditional. It is not towards sinners and unbelievers. It is not an unconditional love. As Daud Rahbar in his book, The God of Justice, writes, unqualified divine love for mankind is an idea completely alien to the Quran. Nowhere do we find the idea that God loves mankind. God's love is conditional. Jesus says in Luke 6.32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. 
And yet this is the highest level to which the God of the Quran rises in his love for human beings. He loves those who love him, who turn to him. In fact, Dr. Badawi, in his uh, brochure on building bridges between Christians and Islam, virtually admits this. Listen to what Dr. Badawi says. He says, correct belief and good deeds are prerequisites for God's grace and forgiveness and for rising above our common shortcomings. You see, it, grace that requires prerequisites, it's not truly grace. We're talking about wages here, about earnings. And uh, this isn't just my Western interpretation. Mohammed Zia uh, Ullah, in his book, The Islamic Conception of God, he is a, 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 a Muslim, uh, explains the attribute of God being all-merciful by saying God rewards our deeds fully. That's what the mercy of God means. He rewards our deeds fully. And he says, we cannot have the least doubt that he will respond to our love by his. You see, it's conditional. It's to those who love him. Those are the ones he assigns love to. So the Quran says things like, God loves those with good will toward others. God loves those who incline to him. God loves those who are clean of heart. God loves those who are ready to fight in his cause. God loves those who prove steadfast in trials. Well, how do you measure up? Does God love you? Not unless you measure up to those standards. Now, Dr. Badawi says, well, look, it just means that God doesn't love the unbeliever's deeds, and he loves the deeds of the believers. Well, I hope that's true. I really do, but that's not what the Quran says. And he didn't give any argument or proof for that exegesis. The plain statements of the Quran are that God is an enemy to unbelievers. He doesn't love them. He loves those who love him and do good. Uh, Dr. Badawi says, in fact, then he goes on to say, I reject the idea of God's equal love of sinner and believer. Well, that is exactly my point. The most perfect being must love sinner and believer alike. That doesn't mean he blinks at sin. On the contrary, he, he must punish sin. And that's why Christ had to die. But God's love as the greatest conceivable being must be impartial and unconditional. Dr. Buddy, we quote the Hadith, but all that proves at best is that it contradicts the Quran, not that, that it's correct. And besides, even in those quotations he read, God's love was still conditional. So I'm not convinced that the Islamic conception of God is morally adequate. Remember my second point was that it's also historically inadequate. It calls Jesus merely a prophet. It incorporates legendary stories. It denies the crucifixion. It embellishes the birth story with theology. He didn't deny any of these points. So I think we have good reasons for thinking that the Islamic conception of God is not wholly adequate and therefore not wholly true. It appears that Dr. Craig has been attributing things to me and putting words in my mouth that I never said. I never said that the Bible is authentic and the fact that I'm quoting from the Bible means simply that I'm establishing evidence from the scripture that you believe in. Dr. Craig puts in my mouth that I said that the resurrection of Jesus after the three days is correct. I never said that and you're witnesses to that. I think Dr. Craig is making his own interpretation of my statement which is totally wrong. Number two, again Dr. Craig goes to the notion of son of man. In fact, the more frequent expression that is found in the New Testament that Jesus referred to himself is not the unique Son of God. This is an interpretation, not the words of Jesus himself. It is actually more use of the Son of Man, not Son of God. Like one scholar once put it, God has sons by the tons. Uh, the question of serving God, Jesus himself indicated in more than one occasion that he came to serve God and he teach people to serve God which again indicate that servantship is not just a Quranic concept but is a biblical concept to be found in Hebrew scripture and the New Testament alike. When uh, Dr. Craig refers to the statement that Jesus is the one who knows the Father because he is in the bosom of the Father as biblical scholar also explain bosom of the Father is a, refer a reference to the uh, emotional or spiritual union which could happen also with other people does not carry any implication of divinity whatsoever. Uh, Dr. Craig also attributes to me that I acknowledge what is in Mark 33. No, Dr. Craig, I never said that. Uh, Dr. Craig mentioned earlier also about the um, apocryphal thing and he said that the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, based some of the material like the gospel of infancy. But I go back and ask Dr. Craig uh, who classified what is apocryphal and what is canonical? 
These were decisions made by human beings, sometimes even were subject to change and modification. And who knows that these books that were regarded as apocryphal were not really falsified or fabrication, but might have carried ingredients of truth that were lost through the process of communication or writing and rewriting the scripture. We never found anyone who claims that we have the entire words of Jesus in the Aramaic language he spoke with ample evidence that it has came to us exactly as he uttered them. Dr. Craig criticizes John Hicks and saying that he lost his face. I think it's easy to label people that we disagree with. It is not only Dr. Craig, Dr. Hicks. As you know, if you have read Dr. Hicks's book, it's not the only writer, he's only the editor. And there are papers contributed by seven or eight. And furthermore, before I show you this one, he said that this is a poor translation that I was referring to earlier on Greek. This is not my translation. This is based on a book written by a Christian theologian and former clergy who did not lose his face because he speak very highly of Jesus. It's called Jesus Christ is not God. I think in a scholarly type of setting, we don't just dismiss people and giving them labels. Oh, these are liberal scholars. These are lost their faith. If there is argument, let's argue on the merits of the case at question. He said that Jesus forgave and that's a quality of God. But we have a parallel also in the Quran, in fact, which means that even when Jesus or Muhammad, peace be upon him, indicate that someone is forgiven, it does not mean that they are claiming the authority of God to forgive, but they received revelation from God that they are forgiving. Those of you who are familiar the, with the Quran, there are references that people have been forgiven. This is not a claim made by the Prophet on his authority, but information just as Jesus was given information. On the question of resurrection, again, Dr. Craig puts word in my mind. I didn't say we Muslims believe in this. I said even if this case is true, even for the sake of discussion, it does not attribute divinity to any person. That's, uh, that's not the case at all in terms to base such an important uh, aspect of divinity on. But Dr. Craig repeated himself again when he came to this moral adequacy. And I kept repeating again, and I thought explained it enough that there is a distinction between God saying, I don't love bias and I love virtue. And if God doesn't say that in some form or the other, whether he says about those who do that or to say it directly that I don't love that act and I love that act, then there is moral inadequacy of that type of God. And again, I take issue with the, the quotation made by Dr. Craig from other authorities who apparently also know very little about the Quran that nowhere in the Quran say that God loves humanity. What would you say, Dr. Craig, and your source about the verse in Surah 17 in the Quran known as Al-Isra, which says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Indeed, we honor the children of Adam. It doesn't say believer or non-believers. How about the numerous verses in the Quran that says God breathed into every human being something of his spirit? I think you were far off, and your authority was as well far off on that with all due respect. When you talk about uh, quoting me again in my presence from my little booklet or brochure, I think what you forgot, Dr. Murray, is that for Muslims, hadith or saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, are not contradictory to the Quran. They elaborate, explain, and articulate the meaning of the Quran. And to us, hadith also is another form of revelation, which even if it's, it's not the name, the exact words of God, they are the inspired meaning with the Prophet using his own words. And if you have read that in my uh, brochure, Dr. Craig, I have lots of other material as well that made reference to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, saying it quite clearly. None of you, he said, will enter paradise just because of your righteous deeds. They said, even you, messenger of God, he said, even me, had it not been for the mercy and grace of God. So this is not a point of contention between Islam and Christianity, that ultimately the grace of God is what counts. If you live like a saint all of your life, sacrifice everything, it would not be enough to equate the gift of sight that God has given you. You don't enter paradise by your deed. This is spiritual arrogance. We both agree on that. But all we're saying that that grace of God is there, available for anyone. But we have to take a step. The grace is available and say, I reject you, I don't believe in you, I do everything against your will. Now give me your grace. That is not logical. So we're saying that faith translated in good deeds shows the goodwill, not that this will enter us into paradise, but would make us deserve the grace of God. 
The other point also that uh, about the crucifixion, I'd like to clarify one thing about it. For the Muslim, Quran is the word of God. Even if 99.9 .9 of humanity agrees on one thing and God says something to the Muslim, this is the word of God. And like I said, nobody can really give absolutely conclusive proof. And when Dr. Craig used the term consensus of the scholar about the crucifixion and empty tomb, there are also other scholars who take a different view. There are scholars who analyze the story of crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, even in the canonical gospels, and they found uh, irreconcilable contradiction. Did they go before sunrise or after sunrise? Was it Mary or Mary the Magdalene and the other Mary or Mary and the other women? What did they see? Was it inside? Was it outside? There are lots of issues like this. Some might say, all right, we can reconcile some. But obviously, if you take the dozens of contradictions in the story, it might raise question. What happened to Judas? One story said that he fell and his tummy was opened and he died. Another one, he said he go and hanged himself. One story that said this was before he returned the money to the Jews in the temple. The other one said it was after this, or that he used the money to buy a farm or orchard. So there are lots of questions. The, the, the consensus that Dr. Craig is talking about is really far from uh, unanimous. But the most important thing really to realize is that while crucifixion and resurrection, which by the way I didn't say I recognize, I say you recognize. I was discussing by your measures. In the Bible uh, is the heart, and I agree, for the Christian theology is the heart of the teaching of Christianity. For Islam, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever if Jesus was crucified and resurrected or not. If he resurrected, God resurrected him and God is superior to him and he is the servant of God. If he were crucified for the sake of argument, it doesn't make any difference theologically in Islam because the death, crucifixion or murder of any prophet does not make him divine. In the time of Jesus, Zachariah, Prophet Zachariah was killed. Also, John the Baptist was beheaded. It doesn't make a person really divine because he was martyred for a cause that he espoused. In fact, this very fact proves the honesty of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the fact that he did not write the Quran and did not think like politicians. Because the issue of crucifixion was a very, very common belief among Christians. Why should he come into conflict with them if he were the author of the Quran? He could have easily told them, all right, Jesus was killed and resurrected, but so what? It doesn't make any difference. This has nothing to do with the vicarious sacrifice. God is not interested in blood. So he was martyred in his cause. The fact that he stands and reveals and recites exactly what revealed to him, contrary to the consensus, but not all unanimity, of his contemporaries, in fact shows that he is simply communicating what God has uh, revealed to him. Um, what else? I think I covered a whole lot and very quickly. All right. The other thing that I take issue with uh, Dr. Craig when he says Muhammad wrote the Quran. This is not just a statement of faith to say that the Prophet did not write the Quran, but there is ample evidence, in fact, rational evidence, including scientific evidence, which shows that the Prophet could have never been the author of the Quran that Dr. Craig rejects and considers to be morally inadequate. In fact, in the Quran, we find minute description of early embryonic stages that has raised wonder in one of the world's famous uh, embryologists, Dr. Keith Moore, and he said it is impossible because many of the information contained in the Quran were only discovered after the discovery of the electronic microscopes. There are historical things that were not known, that was men were mentioned in the Quran to be discovered only 14 centuries later. Dr. Bouquet mentioned, for example, about the discovery of the body of the Pharaoh of the Exodus, that the Bible say nothing about the Quran mentioned. Using space technology, something that was mentioned in the Quran and believed by some of the Orientalists to be mythical, the city of Aram in Eden. Again, only after the space technology was discovered, and before that, even 1975 only, when the city of Ibla was discovered in Syria, and they found in some of the ancient Semitic tablets that this um, city actually was dealing or trading with another city by the name of Aram. That was the first time the name Aram came to be real, not mythical. Using the uh, Ch Challenger and other spaceships, there was an agreement by some archaeologists and NASA, and they sent waves, and finally they pinpointed the, the place where the city of Aram was dug, and behold, 
the exact description that appear in the Quran, Irama Dhat al Ahmad, the lofty pillars were actually discovered. There are things that has been mentioned in the Bible about the Pharaohs. In the Bible always use the Pharaohs. The Quran make a distinction. At the time of Joseph, it says it was king at the time of Moses, Pharaoh, and there is a great deal of significance historically in view of the invasion of the Hyksos and the change of the titles of the rulers of Egypt at the same time. There are a lot more than that, and I think we better review our assumption. Again, I must say, Dr. Craig, you tried your best, I commend you, but you haven't proved anything. Let me summarize briefly those two contentions I said I would defend tonight. First, are there good reasons to think the Christian concept of God is true? It seems to me that we've definitely seen that there are. First, that Jesus claimed to be the unique divine Son of God. Dr. Badawi says in his last speech, Oh, you accused me of saying things I never said. What I meant was that he didn't refute the things, thereby he gave tacit admission in the debate to them in that he didn't dispute them. He hasn't disputed the authenticity of any of the sayings of Jesus that I gave, uh, and moreover, I don't think he's been able to rob them of their full theological significance. Consider the parable of the vineyard. All he's able to say is the word servant is often used in the Bible of human figures. Fine. But that says absolutely nothing about the significance of the parable where Jesus differentiates himself from all the prophets by being God's unique and special son. Matthew 11:27. he's dropped the point about God uh, or Jesus being the only revelation of God the Father. He responds to John 1:18 by saying the divine bosom of the Father doesn't mean that he's God. Granted, it's the phrase, the only begotten God that indicates Jesus' divinity. He didn't dispute that. Mark 13:32. Again, he dropped that point. Instead, uh, he turns to my point about Jesus forgiving sins by saying, well, in the Quran, the property of forgiving sins is ascribed to people. But that's irrelevant, what's in the Quran. The question is, in the Jewish context, in first century Palestine, was this possible for a human being to do? No, as we've seen, that was blasphemous because only God can do it, and yet Jesus did so. Finally, about Thomas saying, my Lord and my God, he says, this isn't a bad translation. My point here is that the Greek is clear. I've got a Greek New Testament here, and the words are, the God of me and the Lord of me, and that is a full Christological confession to the deity of Christ. So we've seen no good reason to dispute my first point, that the historical Jesus conceived of himself to be the divine Son of God. Second, his resurrection vindicates his radical claim. Notice that in tonight's debate, Dr. Budwe has not disputed the facts of the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, or the origin of the Christian faith. All he said now in the last speech is this remarkable statement, but I could admit these things and it doesn't make any difference. Of course it makes a difference, because then the Quran is wrong. Because the Quran says Jesus was not crucified, much less raised from the dead. So if you're going to grant these things, then you cannot be a Muslim. So it seems to me that this is critical to the debate this evening. Moreover, I argue that the resurrection in the historical context in which it occurred confirms Jesus' radical claims for which he was crucified. If God raised this man from the dead, that is God's divine imprimatur or vindication of those allegedly blasphemous claims for which he was crucified. So I think we've got very good reasons for affirming the Christian concept of God. Pardon me. What about the reasons for thinking the Islamic conception of God is true? I argued that the Islamic conception is morally inadequate because God is not all loving. Dr. Buddy re repeats his assertion that these expressions in the Quran mean, I love vice, or I mean, I love virtue and hate vice. But the problem is that's not what it says. It says, I love not unbelievers, sinners, the proud, and so forth. He says, but the Quran says we honor the children of Adam, we give our spirit to man. Yes, it says that. But nowhere does the Quran affirm that God loves unbelievers, that God loves sinners. He only loves those who love him. His love is conditional and partial. He says, but you don't end up in heaven because of your righteous deeds. Perhaps not. But they are a prerequisite. And therefore, uh, if you do not have them, God does not love you. And that is the bottom line in the Quran. But that's a morally inadequate conception of God, I, I submit. Secondly, is the conception of Jesus historically inadequate? Here, Dr. Buddy, we hasn't been able to defend the conception of Jesus in the Quran at all, only by saying that the uh, story in the infancy gospel of Thomas maybe should be regarded as inspired after all. 
Now that's incredible because that's a forgery from two or three hundred years after the death of Christ. Moreover, it contains horrid stories about the boy Jesus striking his playmates dead because they don't do the things he wants. Is Dr. Butterwee seriously going to say that's inspired of God and that's why it can be included in the Kargan? That's incredible. He says there are other scholars who deny the crucifixion of Jesus. I am so confident that that is false, I challenge him to name one. There is no New Testament scholar who denies the crucifixion of Jesus. So I think the Quran clearly has a historically inadequate conception of Christ. In closing, I simply want to say that I myself was not raised in a Christian home. But as a teenager, I began to read the pages of the New Testament, and I found the person of Jesus of Nazareth to be arresting and captivating. After a six-month search, I came to give my life to him personally, and I experienced God in a transforming manner. I believe that you can find him in this same way if you will search for him, Search the New Testament with all your heart and ask if this really couldn't be the truth. I think it can change your life in the same way it changed mine. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to correct you, Dr. Craig. Striking, Jesus striking someone to this is not in the Quran. Give me the reference to that. There is no reference to that whatsoever in the Quran. Secondly, you keep putting the word in my mouth that I recognize resurrection. Uh, and crucifixion. But let me conclude first by saying the Hebrew scripture, which is the basis and the foundation of Christian belief, does not have any reference whatsoever to the concept of Trinity and the word Trinity appear nowhere in the scriptures. In fact, the Old Testament makes it clear that it is a blasphemy against God to associate any with him in his divine attributes. Secondly, in the New Testament, we fail to find any conclusive, more clear statement, not arguable statement that could be interpreted in more than one way that shows that Jesus indeed claimed to be divine. If he were divine, he would have put it in no uncertain terms and not cause confusion even amongst theologians themselves. Thirdly, when you say that he did not give adequate reason why Islamic conception is correct, I say, Dr. Greg, the onus is on you. When somebody is born of a woman, and according to the book of Job, chapter 25, verses 4 and 6, nobody can be perfect or complete who is born of a woman. And walked, was circumcised, ate, went to the washroom, lived and uh, slept like all other human beings, then the onus of anyone claiming him to be God must be on the one who makes that claim, not the other way around. You don't tell me prove that he's human, because definitely he was human. It is the evidence otherwise that is not uh, available. Fourthly, the other side of the coin that uh, I think we should conclude with, I believe, which is very important, and I kept that to the end. We all know that God is not subordinate to anyone, is not inferior to anyone, he's the ultimate of power. This is accepted by all Abrahamic faith. Yet, look at these statements. I can do nothing of my own authority. I seek not my will, but the will of him who sent me. John 5:30, but I do as the Father has commanded me. John 14:31, the words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. John 14:10, including informing the person that he's forgiven. I do nothing of my own authority, but speak thus as the Father taught me. John 8:28, but now you seek to kill me, a man, not the unique Son of God, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. God doesn't hear from anyone. John 8, 40. For the Father is greater than I. John 14, 28. But of that day, the day of judgment, the hour, no one knows. I think that has been acknowledged already. Knowledge of the unseen is a prerequisite of God. In addition to his statements, we are also told that Jews, Jesus was circumcised in Luke 2, 21. It is difficult to figure out how or why God needs to be circumcised when circumcision itself is a sign of a covenant between God and the descendants of Abraham. We are also told that Jesus was increased in wisdom, Luke 2.52, while God's wisdom is eternal and immutable. The story of temptation contradicts the statement in James 1.13 that God cannot be tempted by evil. What is obvious from the Bible, both Old and New Testament, that Jesus was a devout servant of God, not his equal. Jesus prayed to God himself. He fell on his face and worshipped God. But more surprisingly, more surprisingly, 
In the Gospel according to John, Jesus saying, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God, G-O-D, my God and your God. God does, does not ascend to sit on the right hand of himself, that he's ascending to his God. And that again raises a question about resurrection. Muslims do not rule out the possibility that the Quran says Jesus ascended to heaven. There is some form of ascension, there is some form of crucifixion, the explanation of which might vary. Uh, and while uh, some of the writers of the New Testament tended to use these allegorical expressions to ex express their love of Jesus, they did not go as far even as the later dogmas did. For example, in the first Timothy, chapter 2, verse 5, we read, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. I believe the evidence is overwhelming that what happened in history was a complete change. Many people have been asking about a religion about Jesus, but they never ask the right question, what was the religion of Jesus? The religion of Jesus was Islam, submission to God, the same that was taught by Abraham, Noah, Adam, and concluded by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What happened historically, really, was a change of a religion of Jesus to a religion about Jesus, as Muslims, we follow the religion of Jesus. We love him and adore him as a great prophet. Wassalamu alaikum.